Well, Kelsey's given me the opportunity to kick it off. She said, 902, get going. So, <laughs> <laughs> and, you know, I, I'm uh, sort of the figurehead, you can tell, because I'm wearing a tie. But um, uh, I, this, I'm real excited for this day. And, um, and uh, this started months ago. Uh, when I think I started complaining to Don Schreiner in a meeting, you know, one-on-one -on -one that we had together and saying, practically every meeting I get into, somebody says something like, some variation of, I wish we knew what we knew and what we didn't know so that we could solve problem X, whatever that is. And, um, and I thought, and so, but for years, of course, we've been offering money to people to get out there and pull in some of that information, pull together information. And I thought, wouldn't it be wonderful if we could get a group of great people together to um, think about ways that we could collaborate and ways that we could, oh, I don't know, spend some money to do some really good things that, that would be of value to the St. Louis uh, River Estuary and Harbor systems. And, um, and it developed uh, from, uh, through Don's work and Kelsey's work and and Amy and Jesse, uh, Amy Schrank and Jesse Schomburg and Alex Free got together and put together this workshop. And I'd like to thank them for doing that, um, taking a basic complaint and turning it into something really good. Um, I'd also like to uh, thank the, um, uh, the leadership board who helped put this together. And that includes um, uh, Nick Boggio from the uh, 1854 Treaty Authority, uh, Ginny Bridenbach with the uh, Minnesota Land Trust, Jeremy Pinkerton with the Minnesota DNR and the St. Louis River Habitat Work, uh, work Group, and, uh, and of course our, our great um, colleagues at uh, Wisconsin Sea Grant uh, who have been involved, uh, Titus Salheimer and, and Jen Hawkswell, and thank, thank you for being in here with us. And also like to uh, thank Jeff Stolenwerk uh, with the Duluth Seaway Port Authority who um, also was on uh, that leadership board. Uh, things don't happen without people working hard, and I really appreciate um, appreciate all that work. And, and most importantly, I want to thank you all for being here, um, sharing with us on this really pivotal day in the middle of April, um, sharing your time with us uh, and your ideas with us so that we hopefully can uh, make more, even more progress on what's going on in the estuary and the harbor. So um, thank you all for being here. That, I think that's my main thing I need to talk about, except for um, there are some announcements uh, and, some, um, and some reminders. And, um, and, um, and then I'll be pulled off the screen probably. But so the chat uh, feature is enabled during the workshop, so go ahead and use it. Um, sometimes that gets disabled, so it can be used. Um, we're going to only be recording in the main Zoom room. Um, the breakout sessions won't be recorded, and I think that's really important. That means the breakout sessions um, are basically operating on the Chatham House rules. You know, that it allows everybody to say whatever they'd like, and you don't have to uh, be concerned that it's going to show up in a recording somewhere. And that really helps us helps us move the uh, questions ahead. If you're having any technical <laughs> issues um, this morning, um, uh, Chad Manneke from Minnesota Sea Grant is on standby to assist us. Um, please um, uh, reach out to one of the facilitators, and that would be Kelsey, Amy, Alex, Jesse, Don, or and I forgot Ellen. I for, I'm so sorry, Ellen. I forgot to mention you. Thank you for for helping us. Ellen will be um, uh, assisting as well. And um, they'll put you in touch with Chad if you're having technical problems. So just to give you a quick overview of the workshop agenda, there are going to be three sessions. And the first one kicks off this morning almost immediately. In fact, it's already kicked off from about 9 to 10. And um, this is going to be a discussion of funded research program at Minnesota Sea Grant that we're, um, we're keen to use uh, to um, to leverage some of the ideas uh, that come out today um, and also um, talk about some of the present and future work in the St. Louis River estuary, including uh, Lake Superior Headwater Sustainability Partnership, um, some ideas uh, about the future development of long-term water quality monitoring strategies and so on. 
And that's from about nine to 10. And then from 10 to about 1130, there's a facilitated morning breakout session. Uh, well, there, there are um, more, there's more than one. And that's to talk about uh, data, uh, the needs for data compilation with respect to birds, wild rice, and fish. So there'll be three of those breakout sessions. And, um, and those will be um, guided discussions. And they'll, the, the idea there will be to answer some of the questions like what kind of data-driven questions have been asked? Um, what what do what do we know? What do we do we not know? Um, and maybe how we can get to some of the answers that we're looking for. And then there's a break. Um, and make sure you only take a break and and uh, don't disappear. Come back because the afternoon um, afternoons uh, is uh, basically a facilitated uh, breakout session also. Uh, from that will run from about 12:45 to 3, and there we'll be talking about those collaborative project development and prioritization questions, and this will uh, be guided discussion to answer things like what data summary and visualization tools are are being used now, um, how can we improve our ability to understand the current body of knowledge, uh, what are the highest priority research projects that. Um, Minnesota Sea Grant should include in our future RFP so that we can um, uh, move the move the ball forward, basically, and in, in, uh, in the needs of this incredibly important um, area of our world. Um, the workshop goal overall is to generate ideas and partnerships that are going to lead to targeted and impactful Minnesota Sea Grant research funding uh, for the St. Louis Estuary and Harbor System and provide a mechanism for estuary-wide decision-making. Um, and so the, the objectives are, I think, pretty clear uh, from the structure of the workshop, but it'll be to develop ideas for public-facing tools to aid uh, natural resource managers, researchers, and others to, to view data, um, compile and, and unify data on estuary-wide scale. Um, and um, also prioritizing gaps in current data that could be addressed. You know, what don't we know that we need to know? What syntheses need to be built? And how can we fund those? Um, and also, it's really important to us that we um, uh, look at these questions together to identify data sharing partnerships that could make this a, a, a more efficient process and impact of the estuary-wide decision-making processes that are underway. So it's a really, um, this is a really exciting day for me because I, I'm hoping that we will get to a place where we can advance even more than we have so far. There've been lots of efforts in the estuary and harbor and we hope to build on those to, um, to create more knowledge that will help in decision-making. And so with that, that's my, my general figurehead introductory comments. and. Um, uh, and with that, I get to um, introduce Alex Free. Um, Alex is our research and fellowships coordinator for Minnesota Sea Grant, and um, he's the guy who um, helps us set our research funding priorities and facilitates our, our research competitions. Um, Alex has um, joined us in this past year, and he has a really strong research background in the field of environmental chemistry. And um, Alex has uh, lots of specific interest in identifying sources of environmental pollutants and, um, and understanding chemistry, particularly something that's very exciting to me is understanding atmospheric transport of contaminants and atmospheric aerosols, um, and also in studying agriculturally sourced reactive nitrogen. Um, and so Alex is, uh, uh, as I said, is our research and fellowships coordinator. And, um, Alex, Alex gets the next piece of this, so um, take it away, Alex. Thanks, John. I appreciate that introduction. So I'm just going to share my screen here and then get into this. So as John said, uh, I'm the Research and Fellowships Coordinator for Minnesota Sea Grant, um, and it's part of my job to facilitate our research funding programs. And so I'm, today I'm going to talk a little bit about what that is, so I think you should all be able to see my screen here. Um, somebody let me know if you can't. Um, but essentially, it's the way that we try to advance the science around um, our interests and the interests of our stakeholders. If you're not familiar with Sea Grant, I imagine many of you have worked with Sea Grant in some capacity because you're here 
Um, but we're a network of state-based programs um, so that's federalized similar to states compared to the federal government that were part of NOAA. Um, and we have four major focus areas that range from healthy coastal ecosystems, sustainable fisheries and aquaculture, resilient communities and economies, and environmental literacy and workforce development. Uh, and part of the ways we support these focus areas is through a funded research program. So every state that has a sea grant program has a small funded research program where they fund specific projects to support these goals in each one of these focus areas. Um, in Minnesota Sea Grant, we have a specific kind of strategy here, and that is similar to many other Sea Grants. So first, we, we want to enhance communities um, and economies around Lake Superior in the inland waters, so really focusing on coastal communities. And we do this by identifying needs and supporting scientific research to address these needs, and then we communicate these results to the public through extension educators. So today, we're kind of talking about this kind of identify needs portion, um, and I'll go a little bit more into detail about how we do this. So this is a little schematic that I put together um, that really describes the Sea Grant model kind of with the focus on where I fit in a little bit. So first thing we do is we identify needs and that's one of the things that we're doing today. So we work with stakeholders, work with researchers, um, work with our extension educators to really feel out what are the needs for our communities to address pressing problems. And we really do have a focus on somewhat applied research. Um, and we really have a few different mechanisms of identifying needs. So this can be through direct stakeholder engagement. So this could be through things um, like just conversations that our educators have with stakeholders, um, more formal mechanisms. So we have an advisory board that gives us recommendations, um, especially when we're developing our strategic plan and putting in um, project proposals. Um, and then we also have a strategic planning survey that we put out where we get kind of general community feedback. And we also do things like targeted workshops like this, where we can, we know we have a general area, we're interested in doing some research funding, um, so we'll work with you to identify maybe some of those priorities there. Um, but this is not, well, one thing we like to say is this is not the only way we identify research priorities, um, but one of many. Um, and then we take, we take these priorities that we've identified, um, we then put them into requests for proposals, and, that, and then that gets responses from researchers that propose solutions to those problems. Um, and then there's an independent um, peer review that, under, that those proposals go under, followed by a technical review panel, and then finally, review by our advisory board um, to actually review those um, proposals. So we're really, our role in this process is to facilitate that we're identifying these needs, putting them in the RFP, and then facilitating these reviews, and then taking those results and working with our extension educators, CGRAN communications, um, in the researchers to ensure that these results don't just end up in someone's file cabinet, but actually end up in the hands of our stakeholders. So our main workhorse for this research funding um, is through our request for proposals that happens every other year. So we're coming up this fall to a proposal period. So this November, um, we'll have a request for proposal go out and applications will be due in spring of 2023 and funding will start in 2024. So it's a little bit of a prolonged period um, for about a uh, 250 grand grant. Um, it's effectively a little more if you're a University of Minnesota researcher because there's no indirect costs. Um, and this includes about 45 grand a year for um, research funding, and then includes a covered graduate student. And so one thing we like to know here is you don't have to be a University of Minnesota researcher to be eligible for these funds. Essentially, any um, researcher that's in a principal investigator role in Minnesota is potentially eligible. And if you're questioning your eligibility for these funds, um, ask, and we'll do our best to let you know whether or not um, we're potent that you're potentially fundable. We also do fund um, some joint calls with Wisconsin Sea Grant that are usually kind of topic specific. So if you're a Wisconsin based researcher, that's something play a point where that where you might be interested. Um, and if you are a Wisconsin based researcher and you have, um, if you're interested in, a, in our Minnesota specific RFP, if you're on a project that's led by a Minnesota PI, um, you can be a collaborator there. So we have used this funding mechanism in the past. So almost every, I looked back at probably the last five years or the last five funding calls we put out, and almost every one of them has had a project with St. Louis River Estuary in the title. And so here's some examples of what we've done. So these range from tracking muskie in the estuary to understanding methylmercury production um, to supporting efforts of delisting um, and then some more kind of broad landscape process on, under est or estimation and then looking specifically at smallmouth bass. So we've funded a large variety of projects here and you can kind of get an idea of 
where the interests of Sea Grant has lied in the past, um, in the past, and this is what we're really part of what we're help, hoping to hoping to develop today is kind of what we're interested in funding in the future. Um, and just to put some context here, so one thing that we have done is we've kind of put out a call for a kind of a data tool in the past two request for proposals, and we really haven't gotten anything that we've found to be adequate or nobody's really taken the bait um, to really kind of put on this task for kind of putting something together for the estuary today. So this is some of the background context of why we are here today um, is um, to inform this RFP and then kind of better tailor some of this text that we will eventually put out um, potentially. Some important points to understand about our research funding um, process for today. So we do fund research in the St. Louis estuary um, and will be fund will likely be funding research um, in our coming call and then um, through the future of our program. Um, we have a particular interest in applied research and research we can bring back to our stakeholders. Um, and for today, we're really interested in St. Louis River estuary research needs, um, project ideas, and identifying crucial partners and stakeholders. So when we put out an RFP, we can have recommended partners and recommended stakeholders. And so with that, I think that's all for me. So I'm going to hand it back over to Kelsey. Thank you, Alex. Uh, we do have a couple of minutes. So if anybody has a question or two about our RFP process, uh, please, please let us know. Yeah, I'm happy to answer any questions while we have time. So, okay, not hearing anything. So, um, I'm going to introduce the next two presenters this morning. Really, uh, probably need no introduction, but um, Ginny, Ginny Breedenbach is up first. Um, so Ginny is a restoration program manager with Minnesota Land Trust. And Ginny's work is focused on habitat restoration and conservation planning in the St. Louis River estuary. And for the last several years, a significant focus of Ginny's work, as a lot of us know, is managing the Lake Superior Headwater Sustainability Partnership effort, which was formally referred to as the St. Louis River Landscape Conservation Design Project. And so that's what Ginny is going to be talking about this morning. And uh, after, right after Ginny, then Deanna Erickson is going to um, give us some, uh, speak about a, a future project um, that the, the reserve is working on with a bunch of collaborators. And Deanna is uh, the director of the Lake Superior Reserve and, um, and prior to that served as the reserve's education coordinator since, since the reserve's 2010 designation. Um, so with those introductions, I'm going to let Ginny get um, screen shared <laughs> and, and go take it away, Ginny. Good morning, can you hear me okay? Yes. Okay, awesome. So here we go. All right, so you see my slides as well? Yep, they look good, thank you. Okay, perfect. So good morning, everybody. A number of you here have probably very recently heard me present on uh, a very similar presentation um, to what I just shared with the Habitat Work Group uh, a couple of weeks ago. But my, my intent today is to provide an update to the Lake Superior Headwater Sustainability Partnership effort. And this uh, project is funded by Fish and Wildlife Service, uh, and it's a grant that we've been working on for uh, a little over three years now. Just to recognize that there's a, a, a good advisory group of folks that have been really dedicated to, to providing their input and advice for this project, and they are listed here. This, so what's the project about anyway, for those of you who haven't heard, um, this was an effort that was developed to address these questions. What's next after the area of concern work is over? What, so what is the framework for, for our work together look like? What's our vision for the future for the estuary landscape? And how do we work together to get there? So, 
This is an intentional collaboration and information sharing framework that we're developing for transitioning from the St. Louis River area of concern focus to what we're calling an estuary landscape focus. And I'll show you the boundaries of that in just a minute. And two of the primary intents are to establish the Headwaters Partnership Forum with a funded coordinator position and to develop a common set of actionable goals and objectives with tools that will facilitate this collaboration and information sharing moving forward. So the estuary landscape boundary is defined as actually the St. Louis River area of concern boundary, the wider boundary, which is shown here with the, the dark black boundary. It includes all of the Nemeji River watershed, and upstream in the St. Louis River to just upstream of the, the Pine River that comes in in this area. And it does include uh, also direct, direct drainage to Lake Superior up through the Talmadge River in Minnesota. And then a couple of the creeks that are just adjacent and part of um, the city of Superior to, uh, I think Morrison Creek is the furthest east boundary there in the Lake Superior direct drainage section. So the planning, okay, I'm putting planning in air quotes because this isn't intended to actually be a plan per se, but the approach that we're using for organizing is this landscape level, which I just showed you the boundary of, broken down into these mesoscale units. And I'm gonna skip back for just a second. You can see all of these divisions on this map are, um, for example, the Namaji River or the, the upper St. Louis Bay and St. Louis Bay. These are watersheds draining into previously defined geographic or geomorphic zones, depending on your, your terminology um, for, for the estuary. And so our mesoscale planning unit is, is, a, is are these sub, sub areas within this large planning area. And then we consider that smaller than the mesoscale would be the site scale. So the levels of analysis that we have organized uh, this effort in include these three, three levels. Where level one, it, we have gathered information on each of some stakeholder defined objectives um, for each geographic zone. And we completed that work. Uh, we're actually in, in the development of the final products of that, but we did that work in a series of workshops last year that uh, a number of you participated in. And then the other part of, of the level of analysis is this number two, which is pre pre preparing a detailed concept for what natural resources future could look like in each one of these geographic zones. And those are refined based on input for, from the community. And I'll give you an example. We're, we're doing one as a pilot through this effort. And then the intent is to develop an, a level one analysis for each geographic zone moving uh, one to two per year over the next several years. And then beyond a level two analysis would be a level three, which would be a site level project design. And that is something that is not actually part of the Headwaters Partnership Framework, but that would be where, where partners within um, in a geographic zone or, or, or a, have a particular interest in a certain place could develop their own site level project design that would be hopefully consistent with what the overall vision is developed in the level two. So the project, the effort, so let's say, incorporates this multi-sector approach with a natural resources management basis. So we're defining a sustainable landscape as including natural resources management, considering economic development and community health. And while we're not, uh, we're not giving equal weight at this time to all three of these bubbles, because that's a huge effort and we're starting out with this focus on natural resources. But we, what we are doing is considering the specific intersections where natural resources intersects with those other two sectors. And you'll see some of that coming up. So to give you an example of what I was talking about, the level two analysis, this is a draft version of 
the vision for Alouise Bay that was developed with a group of stakeholders um, over the past year. It's currently still in draft form. This is a, an update to a, a draft that, um, that Wisconsin DNR has, has already reviewed. So a number of you on this call were involved in development of, of this um, in some vision meetings last year. So the intent is of this is to show kind of the, the future vision of what we want this whole area of Alouise Bay to look like. So it's showing actions that, that might be taken um, to create certain habitat conditions for target species. So in this area, a focus on creating sheltered conditions uh, and appropriate bathymetry to expand the, the hemi marsh mudflats for marsh birds, shorebirds, ducks, and fish habitat. There are also components of um, community input in this plan right now. There's a this area just kind of generally designated on the south side of Alouise Bay over here where we heard from the neighborhood folks that they really would like to have public access that was a lot closer than having to drive all the way to uh, the end of Wisconsin Point when they live right here. So um, this, is a, this is an example of the vision that over time will have developed a, a figure like this for, for the entire estuary landscape. Another component of this project is the decision support tool and uh, mapping tool that we have up in draft form right now on headwaterspartnership.org. You can go there and see actually on the, on the main page, there's a quick tutorial of how to use the mapping tool. But this is intended to be a place where we share out not only the results from the workshops and, and the information that people have shared with us, but also is to facilitate sharing of these level two vision designs, any products that come out of our, our effort, as well as, as partner efforts. So um, for example, Dan Brenneman is working on an analysis right now of the estuary with the Corps of Engineers that will be shared out on this site um, as, because it directly supports our work in the Headwaters Partnership moving forward. So the more of the focus of what I'd like to uh, talk about as it relates to this workshop today is, is what's happening now in terms of what we're calling our landscape level roll-up. Um, through the process of doing the le level one workshops last year, we got input on what were priority issues for folks, what were things that they were concerned about across the landscape in these geographic zones, uh, what are the types of projects that they really see as important? What are the key natural resources features in each area? And then the threats to them. And after looking at all of that information together, the landscape ro level roll-up part of it is actually identifying this set of priority concerns um, that when we looked across the landscape, they came up over and over again as uh, things that different folks were sharing with us as their concerns. And so right now we're, we're stepping into defining goals and objectives for those priority concerns. And the list of those is here. And they include hydrologic integrity, which includes not just the actually the uh, physical component of water movement, but also the quality component. Fisheries and tributaries to the river, in particular brook trout streams, fisheries for the St. Louis River, in particular Lake Sturgeon. Birds, including migratory and nesting birds. Coastal wetlands, and this includes really all of the wet portions of the river, so it's the broader definition of coastal wetlands, and also includes water quality as it relates to coastal wetland habitat. Wild rice, invasive species, um, both aquatic and terrestrial, and uh, terrestrial habitat connectivity and integrity. And the next three are places where, of course, there are components of the, of the above that, that go into those other sectors in our sustainable landscape diagram I shared. But in particular, these bottom three have 
a more strong intersections with some of those other sectors. And, and they are the beneficial use of drug material, environmental justice and equity, and community engagement. And so, if we take a look at our sustainable landscape sort of map with these three bubbles, um, this is just a draft. This is only my quick input on this. So this needs refinement and input from others. But it's the idea that we can kind of map these concerns across how they intersect natural resources management with the economic development and community health components. So what's happening now also is this is the context of how these priority concerns and the goals and objectives that we're developing fits in for the future. And right now the advisory group is working on developing, uh, reviewing a, a draft memorandum that we've been, of understanding that we've been working on for these tier one signatories. So these would be the folks that have uh, real jurisdiction and uh, over, land management, um, but also uh, jurisdiction over the management of the resources in these areas. So Fond du Lac bands, uh, Minnesota and Wisconsin DNRs, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and the two primary municipalities, Duluth and Superior within the landscape. So those folks would be signatories to this memorandum of understanding. And then all of the others of us who are involved with uh, natural resources work and, and anything that intersects the Headwater Sustainability Partnership are what we're calling tier two and tier, tier three partners. And they would fall um, into folks that would be signing on to particular, particular efforts or being um, recognizing their interest in being involved through letters of support. So the draft memorandum of understanding, uh, this is a brief section of it that kind of gets at really the primary focus of the Headwater Partnership. And the signatories agree to cooperate on the management of Lake Superior Headwaters region and pursue issues of mutual concern. Um, the first one, the parties will strive to implement a system-based natural resources management approach to achieve desired status for the headwaters region, considering economic development and community health considerations. Um, I'm gonna come back to that in just a minute. You can see the others, other bullets here, coordinating on funding priorities and collaborating on proposals, working towards implementing the shared agenda, identifying data needs and gaps and monitoring and documenting progress with the larger stakeholder community. The piece of the priority concerns and the goals and objectives fit into this. It's the systems-based natural resources management approach. So that means for this list of priority concerns, the goals and objectives that we develop are gonna provide sort of the, the, the bounds for us of, of our vision and, and what we are describing as what's most important to move forward uh, together in this region. So right now we're in the, the beginning stages of this all hands on deck effort, which is a partner effort to draft goals and objectives for each one of those concerns I shared with you. And there'll be four to seven folks working uh, in subgroups for each issue. And we're starting with large group instructional meetings that you can choose either the April 26th or 27th date. Um, they'll be recorded for folks who can't, can't be there. And then we'll start um, with a draft based on all, everything we heard so far, giving you new, the, each subgroup information about what's been shared already. The work will be done by the subgroups through May with a draft prepared in the beginning of June. And then that will start our process of kind of reviewing them collectively and sharing them back out for everyone to be able to comment. So just as an example, the, uh, this is an example that was prepared by a small group focused on the brook trout tributaries. And the goal statement is meant to be kind of a future vision statement, where we want to go, an outcome-based statement. 
So for this case, so self-sustaining brook trout, trout populations within watersheds that are resilient to the negative impacts of climate change. So for brook trout, that's the overarching goal. And then you can see there's a, a list of uh, watershed scale objectives then, including things related to water quality impairments, stormwater management actions, et cetera. So the idea is that the objectives would also be rather broad, but would actually be actionable over time that there would be specific projects that you could, could be linking into specific objectives. Okay, I feel like I talked really fast. Uh, so <laughs> the right now we have had great uh, involvement and um, volunteers and also some of them solicited volunteers, uh, but there is a sign up that's still available for anyone who might wanna participate in a particular group. Um, many of the groups are, are really nicely filled out. So thank you to all of you who have participated. Uh, uh, by signing up so far, and there's opportunities for more. If you, any of you who are hearing this for the first time are interested, please uh, either contact me or visit this, this link when I'm assuming we'll share this out the slides with folks in the future. Um, so that is my wrap up of where we stand with the Headwaters Partnership. And, and Kelsey, I'm not sure if you have time for questions or not, but I'm happy to take some if there are. Yes, we do. We have a few minutes for questions. Um, so does anyone have a question for Ginny on the Headwaters Partnership? I'll volunteer one. Great, go ahead, Gary. Gary Glass. I noticed on the brook trout uh, list of things to do for watersheds is to remove the the sediment gathering mechanisms so that the presumably the sediments won't accumulate in the streams. On the other hand, that will only add to the problems of the Corps of Engineers having to to keep the dredged canals clean or, or down to their, their link. So uh, one would think that that some of these objectives are going to be uh, in conflict with each other and one would look to to uh, resolve those conflicts at an early stage. Thanks, that's a great comment. And that um, actually is part of the intent of the Headwaters Partnership is really the people aspect of things to get folks from those different sectors that are involved with those issues together so that we can have direct conversations about the solutions from this more holistic point of view of if we do this here, how does this impact us overall and kind of looking at a system-based approach. Is that, a, is that brook trout thing a systems-based approach? I'm trying to understand what you're, how you're defining that. Well, the, the systems-based approach would be to actually look at, so, so far, um, with the work focused in the St. Louis River area of concern has been predominantly focused on the aquatic aquatic footprint uh, of the river, um, because that's obviously where lots of the impacts, the historical impacts happen. The St. Louis River Habitat Plan has always considered that there are watersheds, you know, draining into the river, but our strategies and the implementation of efforts haven't tied in as strongly with the watershed. So the intent of the Headwaters Partnership is actually to make a better tie between the, the land-based or, or, I mean, you know, land and water that's, that's draining into the river and not just focus on that, that ultimate, ultimate downstream endpoint. So that's what we mean by a systems-based approach is to consider the larger landscape and the interactions between actions in that way. So you would you would include uh, ballast water import as part of the the big picture and the, and the systems because you've got the major problems of lamprey zebra mussels and VHS that that are really the highest priority if you want to protect the aquatic environment. Yeah, that that's actually something that has come up as part of the the. Um, the workshops that we held is is the importance of the ballast water piece as part of invasive species management. Yeah. 
Yeah, Duluth has got the biggest ballast water input of, of all of the Great Lakes, so it's worth looking at. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you, Gary. Willis, you have a question? Yes, thank you for calling on me. Um, I'm a remote viewer from well, a long distance away from uh, Lake Superior and the estuary, but I visit often. And um, my first visit to your workshop, so thank you for putting this on. And uh, maybe I can give you a, a, an umbrella or a, maybe a Goodyear Glimp level look at what I just heard that I find a bit perplexing. And that is that if you have as a primary objective doing research and development, uh, research in ways that uh, uh, spawn further economic development, are you not infusing your program with a bias that may support the very things that have caused the degradation? That is the further economic extraction uh, that most uh, business and industries uh, put on the lake, the estuary, the watershed. Uh, it, it seemed to me to be a conflicting overall goal that if your, your goal was to reverse the impact of extraction, development, land use, this kind of thing, you would not have that in a prominent position on your, your goal. It just seemed to be a contradictory goal. So help me understand how you're going to increase you know, economic development while you decrease the impact on the resource. So first to clarify, there we I didn't make a statement about increasing anything. I was I was talking about the uh, the balance that this is a sustainable landscape that we live in. We we have to recognize that we live in an urban area. Not the entire uh, estuary landscape is urban, but here in Duluth Superior with the port, we live in. A developed area and so the reality is that we have components all three of those components that we have to work with um, and in the in the framework of sustainability and when we're looking forward to, from now to the future what's the best way that we can work together so that those three things are balanced and finding kind of the um the balance point of what su supports all of those things best. So it's in, it's an intentional uh, recognition that we have all three of those sectors involved in our landscape here, and it's intended. And we're intending to promote better holistic decision making, um, so that one isn't isn't uh, making all of the decisions that are then impacting negatively the other components. What you're describing about it with the historical uh, aspects are very true. We didn't recognize previously how important our natural resources were. And so we have this situation of having to kind of fix all of the things that happened in the past. And this is supposed to be looking forward now in a different way of of balancing those decisions together. Yeah, maybe I didn't frame my question very well because I, I agree with everything you're saying there. It sounds very good. And the key word is balance. What we've learned from the uh, you know, global panels studying human impact on, on the earth is that we have over extracted. We have demanded more from the resource that we have. So the balance has been far, far, far toward our human use of the resource. And many of the indicators as I studied Lake Superior and the estuary show the symptoms of worsening uh, impact, not lessening. So if, if there's going to be an objective look here, it seemed to me that it first must start from the premise that, that the resource reflects you know, all past usage in a way that tells us no further development can go in that direction, we must actually reverse. So I'd be looking for research that shows how the human condition in the you know, Duluth Superior area can be sustained uh, while uh, uh, reducing those impacts significantly. 
uh, and, and the mitigation things like what just came out of the IPCC and the IPBS reports uh, and, uh, to the UN talk about how we're going to have to return things to natural conditions and stop using them. So I would like to see you know, research focus come to how do we stop using the resource and let it recover on its own. So thanks Thank for hearing you. me out if that's a little clearer. Thanks, Willis, for your perspective. Appreciate that. And we are running a bit short on time, so I'm going to take Alex's question, and then we'll um, move to Deanna. Yeah, thanks, Jenny. It's wonderful to hear kind of in detail what you guys are doing at the Headwaters Partnership. Um, so I guess what, one thing you talked about is kind of those tiers of organizations. And then I, one thing I'm really interested in is kind of the mechanisms of how the Headwaters Partnership is going to like through that, you talked about an MOU and how it's going to hold accountable and actually do some of these actions. So could you talk about like what kind of weight the Headwaters Partnership may or may not have um, and how I guess we can support things. So like obviously Minnesota Sea Grant tangentially kind of supports things by supporting research in the estuary. So I guess the mechanisms that these partners will use and you will use to support these goals. So this is a, a question that we are all working on answering together because as we, one of the primary uh, reasons to do this work on top of the broad, broader objectives of doing a better job collectively like uh, Willis was just sharing the, the importance of and the reasons why we need to do this um, is, is to get us organized so that we can make also a a forward thinking um, organized collective front together of what for federal funders in particular and others that are looking for places to support this, this type of work. And the more that we put, and we've seen this demonstrated to us in the past as the St. Louis River area of concern got so organized and was so far ahead of head of the curve than other AOCs has received tremendous support from GLRI and, and others. And so part of that is to, to make sure that when folks look to us, you know, they see that we're organized. But we also want to be um, have the intent of, of, of really starting to address some of the things that we haven't focused on with the area of concern. One of those things that we're talking about today um, that has been not as large of a focus as birds. Um, you know, there are other aspects of our work that we need to complete. And so it's also intentionally, um, you know, defining those things so that we can have a starting point now when we're looking out like what needs to happen next. This is, um, we have talked within the advisory group recently, uh, a couple of the members have talked about putting this forth to, uh, EPA and the other folks in the AOC community as this is an example of what's next after AOC. Um, and that's an exciting development. We're also talking about using the Headwaters Partnership as the place to coordinate some of the infrastructure funding um, project opportunities uh, that might, you know, um, be coming to us hopefully soon uh, through uh, the coastal program and the reserve. So um, I hope that gets at some of it. It's, it's, <laughs> thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Jenny. I'm going to um, let Deanna speak now. Uh, we wanted to highlight current and, and future work and kind of just set the stage for this workshop. And, and so Deanna is going to be talking about some, some future work. Hey, everybody. So I'm the director at the Lake Superior National Estuarine Research Reserve. And similar to Sea Grant, we're a state federal partnership uh, led by the National Oceanic Atmospheric Administration and part of a national system of reserves around the country. There's 30 of us that um, do research, education, outreach, and stewardship on estuaries. So that's, that's my role. I'm down here on Barker's Island in Superior where it is snowing really hard. Um, I just want to share a project we're working on very briefly so that um, so that it's kind of, uh, it doesn't need to be hashed through maybe quite as much as it would be if we didn't know this was in progress. So, um, however, I will say it is right now, um, we're waiting to hear if this is funded. So um, just letting you know that this is what's going on. So 
Um, one of the things that's come up quite a few times associated, just like Ginny's saying, with the transition to the beyond the AOC life that we're all, um, that's coming, coming for all of us here, um, is water quality monitoring in the estuary, particularly associated with re restoration sites um, or sites where there was remediation. And so um, the reserve is working um, with NRRI and you and Ruby and Chris Philstrup up at NRRI um, to conduct intensive water quality sampling um, in the 2023 and 2024 season, including under ice sampling and storm event sampling. And what we're trying to do with that is understand what's driving um, degraded conditions in some spots, some parts of the estuary that we're kind of calling hot spots, like areas that might have algae that is like, mm, that's a little suspicious or, or where the harmful algae blooms were last year. Um, so I'm gonna show you briefly where those sites tentatively would be. This is um, proposed as a, science, a reserve system science collaborative project. Science collaboratives, it's a funding mechanism for the reserve system specifically, and they're, they're end user driven. So um, we don't uh, do basic science through science collaborative. We're trying to um, help our partners do what they need to do in the landscape. Um, so each orange triangle is a proposed uh, potential monitoring site. The green spots are, we have uh, four water quality monitoring stations that our first one just went in yesterday, but um, we haven't gotten them all out yet. We've got a lot of ice this year. Um, so we have a real-time water quality monitoring station here on Barker's Island that's collecting data every 15 minutes starting yesterday. Um, we have another one out in uh, the Pokagama River um, that is also our NOAA weather station. You may have seen that if you've ever paddled around out there. Um, and then the mayor requested one here at Billings Park um, so that uh, we can get a better sense on water quality conditions in an area they'd like to have a swimming beach in the future. So that's where we're tentatively looking at um, some of these sites. I also wanna note that this one here um, in Spirit Lake that we'll be working on um, with Kari who's here um, at Fond du Lac. Okay, because we might be able to extend the amount of data that we have there. So a large intensive water quality monitoring sampling project that then rolls in through NR, a grad student at NRI and staff here at the reserve into a synthesis of what, what we're finding out there and a report about that. Access to that data through the, um, we are using ArcGIS Hub now to provide access to reserve data. Recommendations for future water quality monitoring. So, you know, we've been looking at um, water quality monitoring in, in large part either um, uh, longitudinal, like the reserve stations, um, or sort of responsive to specific conditions, but looking at how do we kind of keep our finger on the pulse as climate change impacts the estuary, as land use changes impact the estuary. So some recommendations about that and communications that are accessible to the community, to our partners, um, and to the national system in the reserve. So um, the partners on this include NRI, as I said, um, Fond du Lac Resource Management, um, Wisconsin DNR, Minnesota Pollution Control Agency, and the city of Superior. Um, ideally, if everything goes according to plan, um, which it always does, um, so the we will then use those recommendations to with with all of those partners and and others launch a facilitated process that helps folks decide where we're going to monitor, what we're going to monitor and what instrumentation we'll need. And I'm really hoping we'll be able to draw on some of the really um, remarkable NOAA resources we have, um, including the recommendations of the, the Smart Great Lakes. So, um, so go into a facilitated process, figure out what we need to do. Um, and we do have potentially funding lined up um, through our, uh, our friends at NOAA um, for that process. 
Um, and then we have to figure out how to instrument and, and how to staff that monitoring process. So that's like the big, the big piece at the end, but you know, the reserve has something of a water quality monitoring niche reserves do that. And so um, we're kind of taking on some of the work here. And I just wanted to set that as it's kind of, you know, Ginny is like, how do we, how do we take care of the land long term so that we have healthy communities, which healthy economies are part of having healthy communities. Um, how do we, and then take care of and notice problems that are emerging in our water quality um, as we move forward into the future. So that's all I have to share about that. Thank you. Thank you so much, Deanna. Um, so for anybody who might have questions for Deanna, um, feel free to just chat maybe a private message to Deanna. We don't really have a time for verbal questions right now, but um, yeah, you can get in touch with, with Deanna. Okay. Um, so my job right now is to just really quickly, uh, before we launch into the breakout session for the morning, kind of set the stage for this uh, workshop. So I'm doing that just by um, showing a few slides here, which hopefully you can all see. Um, so, so Minnesota Sea Grant's hope for the workshop is that today is really an opportunity for all of us to acknowledge and celebrate the work that has been done in the estuary. Um, and we have an immense appreciation for the work that has been and is being done. And I sent, and hopefully all of you received, a uh, workshop resources document um, that kind of scratches the surface just a bit <laughs> of what's available with respect to birds, fish, and wild rice. And we sent this uh, um, around to all the workshop participants and um, Amy's going to put the URL for that in the chat as well, um, because we believe that this could be a useful resource and a potential outcome or deliverable from this workshop. Uh, we really hope today also that we can kind of reflect on where we are, take a step back and envision where we, we want to be. And John mentioned that we've heard from our stakeholders that there is a need to take uh, the data that have been collected and turn it into a body of knowledge, um, figure out where the data gaps are and um, see how we can use this information to improve resource management in the St. Louis River estuary. Um, and, and, you know, we want to know, have you, have you heard that too? Um, and, and if so, we really want to use this, um, this workshop as a venue to collectively understand what research, natural resource management, economic development questions are being asked, um, really getting at that, you know, healthy communities theme that uh, the Headwaters Partnership um, is based on, and imagine ways that we can enhance our understanding of the current body of knowledge to better answer these questions, including through the use of data summary and visualization tools. So a lot of uh, this will be discussed in the first breakout session. Um, we're going to be discussing data visualization tools more in detail in the afternoon. Um, part of the focus of this workshop is also partnerships. So again, Minnesota Sea Grant's hope for this workshop is that today is an opportunity for all of us to strengthen existing partnerships, networks, working groups, and um, work toward a common set of immediate research needs, um, recognize which of these partnerships could contribute to a body of knowledge with respect to bird, wild rice, and fish populations and habitat in the estuary, and maybe even generate new collaborations collaborations to address research management and economic development questions in, in new and in, in, in innovative ways. And the last thing uh, that we really want to emphasize is that our hope for today is that this will be an opportunity for us to um, determine what would be useful to know for estuary-wide natural resource decision uh, making in the future, identify gaps in our current body of knowledge that could be addressed in the next five years, and 
really in a co very collaborative way prioritize those research gaps. Um, so this is kind of an idea of some of the things we've learned just in the planning process for um, this workshop. And again, like this is just scratching the surface, but uh, what we've learned is, you know, we know a lot about priority habitat areas for birds, wild rice, um, and fish through surveys and sampling. We know about what threats are to wild rice establishment, but maybe we need more research on the specific impacts of those threats. Um, we, we know about um, sport fish and lake sturgeon populations through all of the survey work, um, but maybe we don't know as much about population and habitat data within the navigation channel. So this is kind of a little flavor of the things that we've been hearing, um, and we want to hear more from you and learn more from you. Um, John mentioned this, but I also want to just again say thank you to the leadership board who have been helping us plan this workshop um, really wouldn't be possible without them. Um, I also um, want to acknowledge that uh, there is a, a significant effort uh, that should be celebrated and recognized, and that is the, um, the delisting package um, that has been put together for BUI2, the degraded fish and wildlife populations. Um, so we want to recognize all of, all of the organizations who contributed to that effort and also just remind everybody that there is a public comment period and that there is a public meeting actually today. Um, and so we are going to be going into breakout rooms in just uh, a minute or so. I want to just have these uh, goals and objectives up on the screen for, uh, for a minute while I, so you can reflect on them uh, while I explain um, the breakout session process. So we have three breakout groups and um, those breakout groups are focused on birds, wild rice and fish. Okay, I believe that we have everybody back in the main room, uh, main room now. And um, oh man, we just had a really great discussion, and I hope you all did too. Um, I am going to. Um, I have asked uh, everybody from each room to kind of summarize um, the discussion for everybody else's benefit. Um, so if we could just take the next couple of minutes and hear about um, the discussion in, in each room, I think that would be beneficial for everybody just to kind of get an understanding of what was talked about. And so Ginny uh, going to go first to talk about the bird room, which is where me and Amy just were. Okay, I hope I do a good job here. Let's see. Um, so for birds, one of the big uh, things that we discussed was that uh, we, we have an understanding of the importance of, of the estuary for birds, for breeding birds and migratory birds. We have a better understanding of, of breeding bird because it's a little bit less complex for monitoring. So that there, we talked quite a bit about for migratory monitoring, it's challenging because of access, weather kind of uh, re related issues, but also physical access to the river to be able to get that full picture, um, the timing and everything for migratory birds. Um, let's see, what else did we also talked about? We have a good understanding of things like where nuisance bird uh, issues occur um, uh, for geese and gulls. Uh, we talked a little bit about having a good understanding of certain species uh, population um, status and over time, including like raptor monitoring, the common terns and piping plovers. Um, let me see, I'm going to move on looking at all of our notes. We also then talked quite a bit about um, what we took to, talked a lot about great blue herons and how they have been uh, known to be here over time. We don't really know if there is a rookery or where it is currently. We talked about how the great blue herons are in decline in general, and so it's actually a really important species to pay attention to. It has been a concern for a long time in the area of concern, but we still don't have a good understanding of it. Um, 
Our group also talked some about, you know, when we're doing restoration work, we have a really limited body of knowledge about how our, our, what, how our restoration actions impact the bird species using the habitat locally, but then also thinking about the impact um, wider than us for the, like the migration and the birds that are coming in from other places that, that we just don't have a, a way of understanding um, impacts of our actions on, on the greater big picture. Um, we talked quite a bit about the big concern of uh, black ash and the impact on habitats across Minnesota and how uh, we need a better understanding of, of how, um, what species could, could um, replace back black ash and then understanding the balance of, should we do action now before we have the research available on that and what the balance is there. And then a large, large part of our conversation for birds focused on really the lack of monitoring. We have had very specific populations uh, that have been monitored um, for certain reasons, like the common tern, piping plover, um, the work at Cox Ridge. We have project specific monitoring that's been done, uh, but there's no programmatic monitoring from the state agencies or even like the reserve um, that that gives us a, a, a reason to have a kind of long-term continuous monitoring data set. We have excellent expertise and, and snapshots in time for specific locations and snapshots over time for certain locations, but we don't have a robust monitoring program. And that's something that's really desired for understanding um, the importance of this area for birds, as well as how our you know, restoration efforts can, can help, um, help them over time. I hope I got, oh, and then we also mentioned how citizen monitoring the eBird is actually really important um, because it's a way for, and it's becoming much more useful as people use it because it's, it's a place where people are going out more often and recording their observations and it can kind of get at some of that lack of the migratory or the challenges of the migratory bird monitoring. Did I miss anything? I don't, that's what I got. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you so much. So that was the, the bird room. And then um, Dave Graham Mason is going to talk about, uh, summarize for all of us, uh, the discussion in the wild rice room. Sure. Thanks. Hi, everybody. Um, so we got into uh, talking about, of course, the body of knowledge. What do we know? Um, we we know how to do wild rice restoration in the St. Louis estuary and we know how to collaborate effectively and that's a really important foundation for building upon. Um, we have really good metrics uh, on the condition of our wild rice restoration sites um, utilizing the monitoring data from 1854 treaty authority on density and biomass. We've been able to identify through uh, monitoring and some research work that's been done to identify goose herbivory as a, a pretty significant factor in the um, establishment of self-sustaining wild rice beds in the estuary. Um, and we do have some really good information on historic habitat suitability for wild rice relative to um, uh, wetland distribution that has been gleaned from like the herding maps, for example. Um, and we also understand habit, habitat conditions like water depth uh, and uh, water quality on the, the impact on wild rice. Um, that's what we're, where we're starting from. Uh, what would be useful to know going forward? Um, you know, relative to, to goose herbivory, for example, at what density is wild rice resistant to goose herbivory? Um, would be a great question uh, to answer. Um, how do we um, how do we monitor for uh, emerging stressors like um, brown spot disease? Um, maybe changes in herbivory pressure from other species. We talked a little bit about carp not being a substantial factor now, but perhaps that could change. Um, when we're talking about goose management, um, got a lot of a lot of goose stuff here. When we're talking about goose management. Um, 
how, how do the removals of geese, for example, uh, contribute to uh, improved growth, uh, improved density? Um, can we, we posed a question, can upriver water releases be managed to expand suitable habitat relative to water depth? Um, and then just having an understanding of some of the water conditions in some of these sheltered bays, there's been some research that's shown that uh, the conditions can be uh, quite different uh, in these sheltered bays, even though they're, they're hydrologically connected, they do have sort of their own hydrologic um, environment. And so understanding water, water depth um, and some of the water chemistry information would be, um, would be nice to, to know. Uh, and then a big one is the St. Louis River Estuary Wild Rice Safe to Eat. So um, we'd like to know a little bit more about um, how uh, metals or other toxins might accumulate in different parts of uh, the wild rice plant. Um, trying to move quickly here. Um, different metrics. Um, one of the things we talked about as a potential monitoring metric is the how robust the seed bank is. Um, because we do know that during uh, years with uh, unsuitable growing conditions, wild rice uh, may uh, lay dormant, but then seeds germinating uh, in subsequent years when conditions improve. So um, how long will seeds uh, maintain in, in the sediment? But then also, uh, can we use the seed bank, uh, some sort of a measure of the seed bank to get an idea of how um, resilient our wild rice beds might be to changing conditions? Um, there's a couple other things on there, but those are sort of the highlights that are jumping out at me right now. So I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you so much, Dave. Appreciate it. Um, so Nick Baggio is going to summarize the discussion in the fish room for us. Hello, everyone. Um, yeah, so our basic, so the question, our first question, our basic understanding of the, of the data, um, we have a good understanding on adult fish abundance and, and presence. We have a good understanding of fish usage in wetland areas within the estuary. We have about 15 years of data to support that. Um, we have a good knowledge of habitat types, like sheltered bays that have aquatic vegetation and that are feeding and nursery areas. Um, we know that rough and round goby populations seem to have stabilized in the last 15 or 20 years. Um, we have a decent knowledge on vegetation bed communities in the estuary. Moving forward. And the second question, um, what would be useful moving forward? Um, an inventory of fish passage issues like culverts and dams would be something we'd look into. Um, what areas are critical for fish during these various life cycles? Like what times of the years are those areas critical? Let me see here. We also discussed um, see, data, how to look into data that's correlating to turbidity to act on dredging navigation in the channels. What are the gaps in our current body of knowledge that should be addressed in the next five years? <clears throat> we discussed how to get aquatic vegetation to regrow more effectively in appropriate locations. Um, data gaps we discussed for citizen science with fishermen, theory that climate related flood events are responsible for vegetation disruption. We also discussed erosion of the bay side of Minnesota Point due to excessive wave action and uh, what is known about the aquatic population density and depth needed to dampen the waves. Um, we also would like to look into quantification of egg and larval predation on lake sturgeon, which is becoming an issue. Um, moving forward, um, what are the most useful metrics? Um, our DNR has uh, 21 sampling locations where they deploy gill nets for the last uh, probably 30 years or so. So we're able to use that. Um, we have um, let's um, contaminant, one of the other metrics is contaminant analysis being done. Um, PFAS sampling has been done in the last year or two. We don't have the feedback from that yet. Um, some of the other 
metrics is a benthic community macroinvertebrates. One of the questions rose is, is there much sampling done there? And is there a want or need to have more data on that area? And are there locations currently not being monitored or plan to be monitored? Um, one of the areas that is would like to have monitored is fish presence above the Highway 23 bridge. Um, we, mainly that area is critical for our reproduction of lake sturgeon. Another uh, Minnesota Point Bayside can, <clears throat> let me see here. Monitor. One of the other things is we looked at, we talked about Minnesota Point Bayside can <clears throat> get into the channel and make sampling difficult. So that was one of the areas we would like to look in in the future. And that's pretty much ours in a nutshell. Great. Thank you so much, Nick. I really appreciate that summary. Um, it sounds like everybody had uh, a really amazing discussion and Alex has raised his hand. So go ahead, Alex. Yeah, no, uh, Tom and I realized that we missed, we stopped, didn't do something we were supposed to do in our session. So I just wanted to say for everybody in the Wild Rice Room, there's a one question survey that we had um, that we didn't do. So if you wanted to take two seconds and do that, um, that'd be great. Tom and I realized we missed that. So just wanted to throw that there where we had everybody. Thanks, Kelsey. <laughs> Thanks, Alex. Um, so we are going to break in a few minutes. Um, before we do that, I want to make sure I give an opportunity for anybody to ask questions or comment about any of the room summaries that they just heard, particularly people who are hearing, you know, the summary from a room that they weren't in for the first time and maybe have questions or insights that they want to add. Um, so I just want to make sure I give an opportunity for everybody to have a voice before we go into break. All right, I'm not hearing anything. Everybody is hungry. So what I what we're going to do is take a break. Um, we will reconvene at um, 1245 uh, this afternoon and um, probably uh, so we're, we're going to reconvene at 1245 this afternoon and then um, we'll have a uh, little bit of an intro into um, the breakout rooms and then we're going to be focusing our discussion in the afternoon on data summarization and visualization tools, ones you use, what you think about them, um, maybe a future um, future vision for an estuary based tool and then we're going to talk about future projects so that ties into Alex's presentation this morning and our um, upcoming RFP. So I'm going to let you all go now. Um, and um, I hope to see you all back um, at 1245. And thank you all so much for such a great um, discussion this morning. Welcome back. Um, really great uh, to see everybody in the room. And uh, Don Schreiner is going to get us started by talking a little bit about how the morning went, but mostly focusing on um, what's in store for the afternoon. Uh, so take it away, Don. Thanks, Kelsey. And uh, thank all of you for attending and especially for hanging in for this afternoon session. Um, it's good to see many folks that I've worked with over the years and especially some of the young fresh faces that are out there just beginning to work on the estuary. As Kelsey said, uh, my name is Don Schreiner. And for those of you who don't know me, I worked on Lake Superior um, with the Minnesota Department of Natural Resources for 25 years managing the fisheries. Um, obviously, I was in and out of the St. Louis River estuary many times and worked with a lot of you on that. I'm hoping that the morning session that most of you both contributed to and learned a lot about uh, your various um, disciplines. Obviously, working in the St. Louis River has been an on, ongoing project for, for a long time. And the work that many of you have done is outstanding. 
and we know a lot more about the habitat and the habitat use by fish, birds, and, and wild rice than we ever have known before. You folks have also built really strong partnerships around each one of these discipline groups. However, there's still specific needs out there from each group that you talked about this morning, you know, that we need to start uh, begin or continue to pay attention to. One of the overall needs that I hear is the need to incorporate many of these data layers um, into kind of a synthesized map and start filling in the information that we would like to know. We understand that there's some excellent tools out there right now that folks are using, and we've heard about this morning, some that are under development. And the last thing we wanna do is reinvent the wheel. So if those sorts of things could be improved upon, updated, you know, that might be the path we take. On the other hand, if a new approach is needed, that might be a path we take as well. And I think we got a lot of great information this morning about you know, what, we, what we know, which is an awful lot. Just a, just a quick personal perspective that I think has some relevance to this conference. You know, Back when I knew I was moving to Lake Superior here, I read a lot of uh, information before I came. One of the things I read was a paper um, titled The Fish and Wildlife Resources of the St. Louis River. I remember that paper because it had a bright red cover on it. And that is like sticks in my mind still. Um, it was a special publication 127 from the Minnesota DNR and it was authored by Art Peterson. So that paper is now 43 years old. And we have had huge advances in our knowledge, our technology, and the understanding um, of the resources in the St. Louis River. You know, I think moving forward this afternoon, I'd like you to think about where are we gonna be 43 years from now? That would be 2065. Obviously, we're gonna have impacts from climate change, continued development, invasive species, land use changes, and a whole bunch of unknown changes that aren't even out there. So in the afternoon session, what we're asking people to do is to begin to visualize and synthesize the data that we presently have on habitat and habitat use, how that habitat might change moving forward, and that will likely drive our management decisions and our policy. So thinking about how do we develop or modify what we have into a dynamic monitoring program and data visualization tool that not only acts as a report card for what do we know now, how are we doing, but highlights specific areas that might need particular attention. So again, in the afternoon session, you know, we seek to, to guide some of our future work on monitoring and synthesizing the data. How do we do that? You folks are the experts. You've been doing it for a long time now. And you know what I saw this morning were with the participants in my group and some of the comments that I saw is that there's a lot of excitement out there right now about this. And I think it's because you've made great progress, you know, especially as witnessed by the public meeting tonight about delisting fish and wildlife impairments in the estuary. That's been going on for since I came here, that is a real, a real concrete um, accomplishment that, that you folks have done. And I think we need to continue that momentum. You know, so hopefully we can continue the great work by discussing and developing some of the general research needs that were talked about this morning um, and providing some potential projects for Minnesota Sea Grant and likely in, um, in association with Wisconsin Sea Grant, where we could fund um, some of these projects to continue synthesizing this data that we do have and the data that we need to build a useful platform that can be used by researchers, managers, and decision makers for moving, um, for moving things forward as you've done in the past for the last 20 years or so. So that's kind of my pep talk. Um, if there's uh, questions about that or questions for Kelsey or I on what the afternoon sessions are shaping up to be, we're happy to answer those. 
I see a question in the chat that is a public meeting on the estuary tonight online. I don't know that, but I'm guessing somebody on this call might. Yeah, for certain, it, there is a in-person location at the Lake Superior Estuarium, and whether or not um, it will be also a hybrid is another question. But I think um, I think Jeremy Pinkerton is on, and maybe Jeremy could answer. I can I can get that answer, but I don't know it off the top of my head. Thanks, appreciate it. So we'll get back to you, Willis. That's my spiel, Kelsey. So I'm okay. handing it back to you. <laughs> um, yeah. So just um, I'm going to put in the chat um, just that a uh, link to the resources document um, that we put together for this workshop. You should have all received it this morning, but um, just in case you didn't, I'm going to I'm going to put that in here. Um, and that is something that uh, we are encouraging everybody to add to because we acknowledge that this is just kind of scratching the surface of what's out there, but we also think that this could be a useful um, deliverable from, from this workshop. So I'll put that in the in the chat in, in just a, a second here. Um, I also just want to give a quick uh, kind of rundown of what the breakout sessions will be like for this afternoon. Um, and uh, we're going to have two and unlike the uh, the morning um everybody will be randomly divided into two workshop uh, two breakout sessions um so one's going to be focused on data visualization and summary tools and the other is going to be focused on future future projects um and so um i think with that if there are no further questions oh i should also mention that uh what we're gonna what we're gonna do since we're having two separate rooms is halfway um through our hour and a half time uh we are going to have the facilitators switch rooms and so everybody's going to get a chance to talk about um the, our two topics for this afternoon um it looks like we have a question from willis is there a a list of contact information for today's participants available um, for follow-up? And uh, that's a really good question. Um, that's a really good question, Willis. And we hadn't planned on providing contact information for uh, the participants. Um, one thing that we could do um, is to just ask um, if there is any objection to providing contact information for the people who uh, participated in the workshop and um, and or uh, we could ask in an evaluation which we're hoping to send to you early next week so maybe that is a good evaluation question willis so we'll ask folks if they are okay with providing contact information um, in some sort of a summary document um, from the workshop and then we will provide contact information for those who indicate that they are okay with it so thank you that'd be helpful you're welcome. And from Jeremy, a uh, follow-up for the BUI2 removal package meeting. Um, so tonight is in-person only. The documents are available to review online um, for the delisting package and the public comment period is still, uh, still open. And so uh, if you can't make the meeting tonight, uh, you can also provide comments uh, through the online uh, forum. Any other questions? Oh, through the 26th of April, you can submit comments. All right. Great. Well, I think I think we're good to go. So um, I'm gonna have um, the our video the video surfaces. Folks are gonna be um, they've randomly assigned everybody to uh, two groups. Um, I think the facilitators. Uh, so Don and I will be in the future projects group, and then. Um, 
Alex, Amy, and Jesse are going to be in the data tools group. And then, like I said, halfway through, we'll be switching. And so um, you should be assigned to your group um, shortly. It was a fantastic, another fantastic um, set of breakout sessions. I just want to thank you all so much for that. Uh, what we want to do right now is just give everyone an opportunity to um, volunteer to share some highlights from their breakout session discussion. Um, and so I, I would just like to hear from you, what are the things that stood out in terms of um, research priorities or research needs within the estuary? What are the things that um, really stood out from the, the group that I wasn't in, the data tools group, um, that you, know, you would like to just kind of highlight as, like, as our final thoughts? Um, and, then, and then we're gonna turn it to John Downing, who's gonna close the workshop for us. But I really wanna kind of hear um, everybody's favorite moment, favorite highlight. Dave, Grand Mason. Uh, thanks for that. Um, yeah, I was in the data tools breakout group and I, for me, it was um, just, uh, again, eye-opening that there's so much data available out there and that I was pretty much unaware of 90% of it. Uh, I'm pretty new to work in the estuary, so that's not um, that's probably not a big surprise, but I think having some way to provide new, new um, natural resource practitioners with a, a list or some sort of a, um, some sort of a index of what's available would be really cool. Thank you. Yeah, I wonder, I mean, you know, we have this resource document that we started, we learned a bunch today, um, and maybe that is uh, uh, just, you know, that document can be the start of what would be uh, a more comprehensive, um, you know, look at all the different data tools that are out there, places to find data, as well as like you know, all of the planning documents that are available. Um, yeah, I, I um, would find, personally find that extremely helpful. Anyone else? have anything they'd like to, to share as a highlight. Um, no need to raise your hand, you can just say it. Hey, I'll, I'll jump in. And uh, prior to this meeting, I was cleaning my office and I came across uh, these tabloid size um, printed spreadsheet that I sent photos of it to you, Kel Kelly, Kelsey and uh, Alex, of a previous uh, Minnesota nearshore habitat workshop with lists of data sets. And many of them are marked not available or linked in work and things like that. But yeah, it's, it's maintaining these. Maybe it's, it, you know, we need to repeat these efforts now and again. And it brings um, fo new folks on board too with raising familiarity about what's out there. Um, but one of the things that struck me and that I see more and more is this, this idea of data repositories and the interoperability among those to develop apps that mash those data sets together for more utility. And I, I think we're really on the cusp of some new approaches in that regard. I'm excited about that. <laughs> Thanks, Tom. And yeah, we will we'll take that that information that you sent us and and add it to what we've already started. Really appreciate that. Uh, Jenny, by, by the way, my my puppy ate that just shortly after I took Oh it. no. We'll send it back to you so you have the photo. <laughs> <laughs> Jenny, did you have something you wanted to share? I it, so this is really just um intended as a compliment to you, Kelsey, Amy, and Alex uh, for a really well organized and communicated um, online workshop today. So thank you. I know it's been a lot of work for you getting organized and talking with so many people. So thank you. Thank you, Jenny. I appreciate that a lot.
I'll jump in to say that in the data in the afternoon data sessions, having done two sessions of the same topic, it was really interesting to see the different focus of each session. It was really great to have two sessions because we really focused on some was a lot of tools, others were thinking about social, public facing, different types of things. So I think having those two sessions, it was really interesting to see the different foci of each session. I enjoyed that. Yeah, yeah, I I was really surprised um, how different um, because we had the research priorities. Don and I had the research priorities group, and um, I think that we got pretty different, um, you know, just overall research priorities from each group uh, of people, and that that surprised me. I I don't know. I think I was just coming in with the assumption that it might be pretty similar. There were some similarities, uh, I think, in both groups. Um, uh, long term monitoring of AOC restoration sites was mentioned. Um, uh, just long term monitoring plan. Um, so, you know, long term monitoring is something that people are thinking about. And that was something that we wanted to talk about and did talk about somewhat this morning. So I'm, I'm glad that we we did get a chance to talk about it. But um, overall, yeah, we've got um, with the two groups, just a really, really great list of research priorities for uh, for us to consider. Uh, it's great. Any other thoughts? I don't want to turn it over to John too early, but I know that you know it's been it's been a long day for for everybody, and we appreciate you hanging in there all day with us today. Yeah, and so um, maybe one question to all of you. Um, because I don't, I don't think that we want to determine this, but one question to the group, now that you've been through the morning and the afternoon sessions, um, one of the questions that we have, I guess, outstanding um, is where do we, where do we go from here? We're looking at this as a first step. We know we have research priorities that are going to be, uh, we're going to be considering for the RFP, um, but we also have all of this information that we've uh, collected from you all today. And um, from your perspective, your view, what would be some really useful deliverable outcome document? Um, you name it, uh, we'd like to hear what your thoughts are on what we could provide as an outcome of this workshop. You know, I, I could jump in just a second and, you know, Tom kind of got us going, you know, thinking about pulling things together. A couple comments have been I didn't know all the data were out there. We did, I didn't know what was out there. And that was always my suspicion. You know, when Don Schreiner and I started first talking about this, I thought, I know tip of the iceberg kind of, and everybody else knows some other piece of the iceberg. And wouldn't it be nice to have a more global view and global access? And I don't mean to answer your question, Kelsey, because I also asked that question, but I mean, I the where do we go from here is is really important but it is as i suspected that there is a lot of hidden information not maybe not hidden and nobody's hiding it on purpose but there is a lot of really relevant information and it seems i think what tom was kind of going toward was you know maybe there's a way we can use ai approaches or something to begin to Bring these data closer to knowledge and you know how do you do that that takes expertise i don't have and but it takes knowing what's out there and then figuring out how to make it all work together or at least be someplace so that we don't have to i don't know put i mean the fact that the outcome of a of a previous workshop was eaten by tom's dog is kind of concerning to me. You know, it should be it should be inedible somehow, right? And it should get out there. Um, it seems to me it, 
we should put this, you know, there should be the ability to get to all the these important pieces of information more readily. I don't know, it's just I'm, I'm thinking out loud, but I have big spreadsheets like that too, Tom, you know, and I think in in five years, I won't even know what this means. And um, and how can we how can we give this more longevity? How can and and make it more available? Because clearly this is an important system, and the fact that you all so kindly would dedicate so much of your time to this is really important. So you know, I'm just trying to think how to. There must be new techniques that we can use to make more stuff available and, and accessible and usable and and things, you know. And it, yeah. Anyway, I'm 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 just I'm thinking out loud, but it just see, is concerning to me. You know that there must be a way to do this. Yeah. Um, and I think Alex has a, a thought to share, and then Carol, you're you're next after Alex. My thought kind of builds a little bit of what John said, right? That I kind of report out some of what this last data tools group kind of said and reflects a bit what Dave said is that, you know, there's a lot of data that exists. They're not, there's not like a, it doesn't seem like a nice centralized place to kind of learn what exists even. So even kind of before the building and artificial intelligence that synthesizes everything into a nice map, um, having a place like a data tool, like I, I say a data toolbox where the data tools are, where you can go and say, oh, look, um, NRI has this natural resource atlas it's used for X, Y, and Z. Um, that's something that, I mean, potentially is a relatively easy do to kind of put these things together and have them on like a web page or something like that. That's nice and accessible um, that I think might be a potential thing. Also kind of, I'd like also just kind of say thank you all for your contributions to the research ideas. Um, there's no guarantee that these are going to be funded projects through Minnesota, the Minnesota Sea Grant RFP. I mean, um, it has to make it into the RFP from here, and then we have to have someone that wants to do it, and then it gets reviewed well. But these are the uh, doing things like this really make it so we can actually target um, that RFP well um, to actually address needs. Um, so thank you all for that. Thanks, Alice. Car uh, Car Carol, you're up. Yeah, uh, in the Habitat work group, we've talked a lot, um, kind of in response to what John was saying, we've talked a lot about having common websites uh, where data could be downloaded and maps could be reviewed. Um, and it seems like the biggest challenge has been finding a stable support platform. You know, who's going to be responsible for maintaining that website and, um, and making that website cross the jurisdictional boundary? You know, it almost seems like it needs federal funding to be able to maintain that kind of platform. Uh, because neither state really wants to take on the other state or is allowed to take on the other state. Um, and so I think if we could somehow find a stable platform for these data sources, we have loads of data um, that could be shared. And I'm not sure that Diver is adequate to, to cover all of them that uh, we have locally. Um, and just for an example, and this is kind of related to what Tom mentioned, he mentioned data on DVDs. Um, the, the 2002 Habitat Plan had maps and loads of data on a, a CD. I just shared all those with the Habitat Work Group um, platform. Uh, but, you know, those so far for 20 years, we've only had the text of the report, none of the appendices and none of the maps. And that's really useful data that no, only the people who happen to get the three ring binder and the CD happen to have. So there's a lot. I'm sure that, like Tom says, there's lots of data out there that need a, a common home on a platform that's going to be long lasting and supported and maintained. Thanks, Carol. You just solved the mystery of the appendices for me because I have been wondering that myself. Where did they, what happened to them? I was Google searching and trying to figure it out. I should have just asked you, but um, I'm glad to, to know that, you know, they're still around just in a format that's difficult for us to access now. Well, All right, they, Tom. Oh, go ahead, Carol. There used to be an easier link to get to the report and we're working on creating, uh, you know, Ramage is working on creating a better link, I think. Great. Okay. All right. Go ahead, Tom. And then Willis, you're next. Yeah, I was just going to mention, you know, 
we, like a lot of agencies, are probably seeing a lot of retirement. So we're having a lot of people go and we're losing a lot of institutional memory. So to go back to that idea of maintaining these data sets across new um, platforms from floppy disks to DVDs to now networks. And at our lab, we have um, our network drives full of data from people that have now retired and a few of us that understand what are in those um, directories. So we have a, a, a project now we've titled The Elder Project, which is uh, Ecologic Legacy Data Restoration. And um, we're going through with some computer programmers that are crawling through those, those folders and directories and developing tags for all of those that will then go into a catalog. So it'll be a searchable catalog. So there's some technologies available to to do that type of type of work and it might be useful. But also, you know, maybe as people retire too, there's a, a, an interview process. I'm thinking of people like J Brian Fredrickson had amazing um, resources that, that, that they had brought together for some of those initial efforts in the St. Louis River Estuary. So maybe, you know, an exit, exit interview about the data sets that, that they see as valuable going forward and things. Yeah, that's a, that's a really great idea. Okay, Willis, you're up. Yeah, I just want to thank the group. I'm somewhat of an interloper here, and you all treated me very well. <laughs> you didn't, didn't shun me. But uh, because I've been invited into your area to act as a technical advisor to citizen groups, uh, participating in the Section 111 study, some of you don't know about the Corps of Engineers doing that on Minnesota Point, but I'm also uh, involved in the long range planning uh, process with the city and those folks out there. And I just want to reiterate what I said in a smaller group that decisions are being made uh, uh, that affect the resource every year and long range plans are being made based on incomplete data. And the sooner a, a product could be delivered into the public arena where decision makers work and live uh, in a comprehensive way, the better. Uh, these projects that are being planned, uh, and long range plans are being made, are going to impact the resource that you all are studying. And they become variables. It's hard for you to you know, get a picture of the static if the picture is changing on you. Climate change is going to do that to you anyway. So the sooner that there's this good interflow of information between the research community and the policymakers, uh, the better. And I, I want to be the facilitator of that if I can. So uh, I'm going to be in your community for several years doing that kind of thing. So it's good to get to know so many of you doing all this good work. I, I learned a lot by just you allowing me to sit in on your session today. So thank you. Thanks, Willis. I'm really happy to hear that you you felt like this was valuable and you learned a lot. Um, any final thoughts before I turn it over to John about um, outcomes, uh, deliverables from the workshop? All right, John, you're up. Well, I, I kind of feel I kind of feel as if we've opened a box and looked in it and found some really great stuff in there and um, fantastic vision that we can have um, if we work together on figuring out ways to make data accessible and available and ask the right questions together. And I would like us to not lose that kind of momentum and that kind of vision. I, um, you know, I hit. I was thinking about the data from my lab operations over the last few decades and just keeping track of what all that is and what it all means is, I mean, we studied hundreds of lakes, but just keeping track of that, getting the, keeping the metadata together on that is a real job. And it, and it would even, it could even be a good project to describe what's in these data sets or track down someone who knows what's in these data sets because that longer term data, as Willis was pointing out with everything changing, um, 
longer term data are really important. I realize that our time window that we're talking about here is a little bit shorter, but um, I think it's it's super important the the set of dossiers you all have opened up, and I feel very very grateful to you all. I I guess you know what I'd really like to do is not close this, you know, uh, because yeah, I feel as if we've opened a door and. And I think that's what Don and I originally had in mind and with, and Kelsey was so kind to jump in and do tons and tons of work and, and Amy also and Alan Munchauer and, and Jesse and, um, and Alex too, putting this together. I, so I feel like we've opened a door and I think it would be a wise thing to do to figure out how to open it wider and figure out what, you know, more about what it is you all have been thinking about today. And I, I hope that we have some way, some way forward in that. And, but in addition to thanking those in my crew who have um, put this together, this really excellent uh, workshop, um, I'd also like to thank our leadership board again, and um, Nick Boggio and, and Ginny Bradenbach and Jeremy Pinkerton, and Titus, Salheimer and Jen Hawkswell and Jeff Stolen work. Thank you for your excellent work on helping us guide guide the creation of this um, wonderful um, day of reflection and investigation. Thank you. But the real thanks goes to all of you. The big thanks goes to all of you who are willing to dedicate your time and effort and thoughts and ideas to Finding, finding new ways of pulling information together and answering big questions in the um, St. Louis River Estuary and the Harbor, Harbor region. And thank you so very much for your time today. I learned a lot. I had to jump out a couple of times, but I learned tons of things and so much appreciate the efforts of all of you that you have put into this. And uh, I, I'm, what I'm hoping is that there are interactions that have cre been created today and synergies and ideas that have been created today that will give rise to new proposals, new ideas, new thoughts about how to how to aggregate information, turn well, turn data into into knowledge um, that we can use for this wonderful resource. So I think thank you so much, all of you, and I appreciate. Um, all you've done. Thank you. Any parting words, Kelsey? Kelsey, you, uh, Kelsey carried carried the main ball on this, and uh, thank you, Kelsey. It's been um, we uh, deeply appreciate it. You haven't been with us long, but wow, you know it, this is a this is a great thing. So thank you. Oh, it, it's been a pleasure, John. Uh, I just I want to echo John by saying thanks. Uh, thanks to everybody for taking the time um, to be here with us today. And um, uh, just that we appreciate all of the sharing the end discussion. Um, it's been really great. And um, and yeah, uh, I, I just I, I can't say it enough. I really appreciate your time so so okay i think we're ready to wrap up then and close the zoom room have a great uh rest of your day and rest of the week thanks okay. everybody. thanks everyone thanks everyone thanks all wonderful thank you everybody.